Good evening, everyone. Hello, hello, hello. Good evening. Hello. Earth the congregants. Earth the congregants. Come in, please. <laughs> this is the captain speaking. Earth the congregants. Welcome to Calvary Chapel, you guys. Come on in. Have a seat. And get comfortable so we can get going with today's uh, study and today's service. Welcome. I'm delighted that all of you have come tonight for our midweek Bible study, our Through the Bible Night. I'm glad that you are here. So um, let's uh, open with a word of prayer, shall we? Gracious and Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for bringing us here tonight. We thank you, Lord, for calling, putting it upon our hearts that we might come here and fellowship one to another, that we might come here and worship you and praise your holy name, that we might come here, Lord, and study your word and be filled with your word to overflowing with love, Father God. Thank you, Lord, for the saints that you've acquired tonight and brought here tonight from all over the place, Father. Thank you, Lord, for just loving us so much that you just thought of us all long, and you sent your son Jesus to die for us, Lord. Oh, my. Sometimes, Lord, it's just overwhelming to remember that love that you have for us, Lord. But we accept it by faith. We're so grateful for you, Father God. Now, Lord, we ask a blessing upon each of us tonight as we gather together, Lord. May the praise we sing come up to your ears as a sweet sound. May it come up to your nostrils as a sweet-smelling aroma, Father God. And may you look down upon your children and be pleased as we worship you from spirit and truth. So we thank you, Lord. And, Lord, give us ears to hear your word as we study tonight, Lord. And help us, Lord, just to be doers of your word, not hearers only, Father. So we thank you, Lord. We give you all praise, honor, and glory that's due your name. And we all pray this in the name of Jesus. And the church said, amen. amen. Won't you stand as we worship the Lord? There is joy in the Lord, there is love in His Spirit, there is hope in the knowledge of Him. There's a fountain that flows like a river from heaven, abounding in love to my soul. All blessing and honor are His. All glory and power are His. Let all wisdom and strength be the Lord's in this place. Let all glory be given to Him. There's a fountain I know Every time I am near it My heart overflows to the Lord All blessing and honor are here All glory and power are here all wisdom and strength be the Lord in this place. Let all glory be given to Him. There is joy in the Lord. There is love in His Spirit. There is hope in the knowledge of Him. There's a fountain that flows like a river from heaven, abounding in love to my soul, abounding in love to my soul, abounding in love to my soul. Amen, amen. You 
are my joy, you are my song, you are the well, the one I'm drawing from, you are my refuge, my whole life long, where else would I go? Surely my God is the strength of my soul. Your love defends me. Your love defends me. And when I feel like I'm all alone, your love defends me. Your love defends me. Yeah. Day after day, night after night, I will remember you're with me in this fight. Although the battle is raging on, the war is already won. I know the war is already won. Surely my God is the strength of my soul. Your love defends me. Your love defends me. And when I feel like I'm all alone, your love defends me. Your love defends me. Come on, church. We sing hallelujah. You're my portion, my salvation. Hallelujah. You're my portion, my salvation. Surely my God is the strength of my soul. Your love defends me. Your love defends me. And when I feel like I'm all alone, your love defends me. Your love defends me. Come on, church, sing this one. We sing. You are eternal, 
Love everlasting, reigning on high. Holy, holy Lord God Almighty, worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Oh 
mighty Who is this King of glory The Lord strong and mighty You are the King of glory The Lord strong and mighty You are the King of glory The Lord strong and mighty. Yeah. Amen and amen. You guys sound good. Yeah. Right, you guys sound great. Greet each other and tell them Jesus is the King of glory. Jesus is the King of glory. Amen. All right. Nothing like praise the lips go. Well, good evening. How are you? It's great to see all of you tonight. Wow. You guys do sound good. You're our new choir. That's right. Good. That's good. Naturally, I came unprepared. Carl has to help me out here. Thanks, buddy. Thank you. So a few announcements that I want to share with you. They're, 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 we have a lot of things going on in the week, and they don't really change that much. But we want to remind you of what's happening so that you can get involved in one of these things that's happening. Tomorrow, men, we're at the flight deck. You know that. We're at the flight deck, and some of us get there around 7, and it's around 7.30 or so. We order, and we have a great time of fellowship, and, and, so, and always good food because the, the flight deck serves a pretty good breakfast. So come on out, guys. That's tomorrow at the flight deck right around the corner. Then at 10.15, we have a devotional that is over the airways on Facebook and YouTube. So you can tune in on Facebook, Calvary Chapel Cape May, or on YouTube, Calvary Chapel Cape May, and you can watch it there. And it's there all the time. In fact, all the ones we've ever done are there. So you can always go back into the archives and look. If you would like to come and join what we call our studio audience, you're more than welcome to come in and join us as we go live here at 1015 tomorrow morning. Friday. Um, we have a men's study back in the children's ministry. We're going through the book of Romans, and we're going to be in 14. We're going to be starting chapter 14 in the book of Romans. Men, come on out for that great study. Um, Women in Prayer this week is going to be at our house at 203 Deborah Avenue in North Cape May. So uh, Mark and Rini have a funeral that they have to attend in uh, Pennsylvania, so her house is not going to be available. But prayer this uh, Friday will be at our house, 203 Deborah Avenue in North Cape May. So, And at 11 o'clock, and that's at 10 o'clock, by the way. At 11 o'clock, we have another Devo here on Facebook and YouTube. You know our Sunday morning services. We've been blessed to have two services at 8.30 and 10.30. And I'm excited because we're coming back to prayer at 6 o'clock Sunday night, our corporate family prayer. Oh, how it's needed in this day and age, the time. Um, ladies, your breakfast at Uncle Bill's is this coming Monday, June 6th, just coming Monday at 8.30 in the morning. And then Freedom Through Christ, 7 o'clock at night with Pastor Mark and Rini and Carl heading up that incredible ministry. On Wednesdays, there's two um, ministries go on on alternate Wednesdays. They're at Cape Regional Recovery today, so they'll be back there on the 15th of June. But next week, they'll be at Conifer Village on June 8th. That all starts at 1 o'clock. And you know what happens Wednesday night because you're here. See that, how that is? A okay. couple things I want to uh, give you a heads up on. The Sight and Sound trip on August 9th, there's only 13 seats left. Praise God. 13 seats left. If you have signed up for it, you're in. Okay? Um, there's a new sign-up sheet out there, but it only has 13 spots on it. So if you've already signed up, I got your name. Please don't re-sign up, okay, because we, we need a good count. The bus will seat 52 people. Actually, that's only, that means there's only 12 spots left. So 
There's only 12 spots left if you want to go. That's on Tuesday, August 9th. The charge will be, the fee will be $100. That includes your bus ride to Sight and Sound, uh, lunch at Shady Maple, and um, the ticket to get into the uh, see David. So um, it's got a really good time. We're having a community outreach. We're having a community outreach on um, June 18th. It's a Saturday. It's going to be over at the shop, Village Shops of Rio Grande, over behind Mimoji's in that strip right down there. Um, we're going to set up over there. It's going to be very similar to what we did in the winter, but it won't be as cold, praise God. <laughs> Oof, that was one bitter day. But anyhow, we're going to have the same type of thing. We're going to have some sandwiches. We're going to have some food. We are collecting clothing. We're collecting socks and shoes and clothing and those type of things. We're collecting toiletries, anything that you possibly can donate to us. Bring it in. We'll keep it. We'll get it all taken care of. We're probably going to have another um, time on Friday night, the 17th, to where we sort out the clothes, make the sandwiches, and get ready for our outreach. And we'll tell you more about that when the day comes also, our church picnic, a oh, great time. Our church picnic is June 26th. It's Sunday, June 26th, and it's right after second service down at Cape May Point where the lighthouse is, and that state park down there is where we're going to have our church picnic, and we will provide the, the meats, hamburgers and hot dogs and things, and this, the water for drinks. If you would supply salads and anything else you want to bring at that time. So uh, Todd is here and he will be uh, leading up that, that time. So more about that later. This Sunday you will be getting an insert in your bulletin that gives you a rundown of all the details and things that are happening this summer. Um, for those of you who are waiting for a VBS, Vacation Bible School, August 15th for five days, we're going to have a vacation Bible school from 6 to 8 at night. We've already chosen the curriculum. It's going to be a lot of fun. And if you can be a part of that, check with Mary Maniac. She'll be looking for volunteers to help out with that. Baptisms on the beach on the 21st of August down at the sunken ship. Baptisms on the beach. Um, let's see. We have a lot of things happening. Well of a day on uh, July 9th. Um, over in Clubhouse Road, we'll be there. Um, Pray for America Breakfast on July 4th. We'll have our time here. That's on Monday, so lots happening, and it's exciting, and keep in tune, and we'll let you know what else is going on. But the thing for the day is a Bible study. we got to get to God's Word. I feel the need to, to get to God's Word. We are in Nehemiah chapter 6. If you have your Bibles, please open them to Nehemiah chapter 6, and um, get ready to go. It's an exciting chapter moving towards my most favorite chapter in the book of Nehemiah, which is chapter 8. I love chapter 8. But anyhow, we're in chapter 6. I tried to get through 7. We still might. I'm not sure, but we'll see what happens. So if you need a Bible, raise your hand. Raise your hand. Look at you guys coming to a Bible study with your Bible. You make your pastor happy. Yeah, you make me happy. Come and do a Bible study. That's wonderful. So that's great. Now, if you need one, nobody's going to raise their hand because I don't want to. <laughs> I don't want to know I don't have my Bible. That's okay. Nehemiah chapter 6. I've been enjoying the study of Nehemiah. He's my new boy. I like him. I, I just really, really get a kick out of him and the things that he's going through. Um, today's message is entitled, Be Watchful, Our Enemy Speaks Only Lies. Be Watchful, Our Enemy Speaks Only Lies. Lies. So won't you bow your hearts with me as we pray for our study tonight? Most gracious Father, we come to you now, having worshipped you in spirit and truth, having poured our hearts upon you with worship and praise, having your Holy Spirit move in through and among us during the time of praise. Oh, what a wonderful time it is when your saints gather together, when your children gather together and praise your holy name. Thank you, Lord, for this time we had. Now, Lord, we pray, Lord, that you would settle our heart. Pray, Lord, that you would settle our heart, open our ears and our hearts to receive all that you have for us today through this incredible chapter, Father God, as we can glean and learn from Nehemiah, not only how to be a leader, but how to be a Christian and how to walk circumspectly in the love of God. So, Lord, thank you for all you are and all you do. Bless these saints abundantly today with your love, Father God. Pour it out upon them, each one of them, Lord. So, Lord, we look forward to what you're going to do in our hearts this, this evening. In Jesus' name, amen. So if you've been with us for our studies in Nehemiah, Nehemiah is an incredible leader. 
He really is an incredible leader. He has been called by God to go back to Jerusalem and restore the, the, the walls and the gates of the city that were in disrepair. You remember, years and years and years and years and years before that, Jerusalem, Judah, and Benjamin were carried away to Babylon. And after 70 years, they were coming back. And remember, we studied Ezra, how he was the first group to come back and how they rebuilt the temple and all the things that went on there. And now, years later, Nehemiah prays, and the Lord leads him to ask Artaxerxes if he can go and now restore the walls because he hears from his brother that the walls of Jerusalem were in disrepair. So here, the Lord uses Nehemiah and sends him, but the Lord also uses Artaxerxes. Because remember, when Artaxerxes wrote the letter, giving Nehemiah permission to travel back to Jerusalem and begin constructing with the wall, that was like taking an hourglass and turning it over and starting a time. The time would then begin to tick. Till when? Bueller? <laughs> Till when? Till, till Jesus comes into Jerusalem. Till Jesus comes into Jerusalem. Remember the prophet Daniel. Artaxerxes writes the letter. And that starts the time. Ticking. And 483 years later, to the very day, Jesus on a donkey rides into Jerusalem and he's hailed as king. We call it Palm Sunday. So it's a very, very important thing that, that, that happened here with Artaxerxes. And the Lord is using a Gentile. He's using a Gentile to set his time clock for the uh, appearance to Jerusalem of their Messiah. Anyhow, under Nehemiah's incredible leadership now, the people completed the rebuilding of the walls. They withstood the enemy's attacks. So we talked about the enemy's attacks, the ridicule. They called them bad names, and they tried to ridicule them. They tried to discourage them, and fear was thrown at them. They, they caused them to fear. We talked about fear being the opposite of faith. And fear was the enemy of faith. Because when we're afraid, our faith seems to quell down. But we know that the Lord hasn't given us a spirit of fear. But a spirit of love, power, and a sound mind. We know that. And all along, they withstood the enemy's attack. They withstood the enemy's attack. And then, when the enemy couldn't get them from outside, he changed tactics and came from within. From within the group, he started having people complaining because they were selfish. I want what that guy has. How come I can't build that wall? How come you like him better than me? How come he's getting this? And they started to complain and bicker among themselves. And the more the enemy came at them, the more Nehemiah prayed. I love this guy. The more Nehemiah prayed, he was a man of prayer. And he constantly prays. And throughout his book, we read of his little prayers. And we're going to read a couple today. And I love this. The more the enemy came, the more they prayed. And guess what happened? The more they prayed, the more they were victorious over the enemy. Go figure. The more they prayed, the more they defeated the enemy. I love that. But the only thing that remained to be completed was the restoration of the gates. Now, these big wooden gates, there's a bunch of them around the city. Remember, they started with the sheep gate, and they went around that the strengthening of the community also behind the gates. So they had to put the gates in place, and then they had to strengthen the community in God's word, which we're going to get to when we get to chapter 8. It's all about God's word. Well, Sam Ballot, I was trying to think about that name, Sam Ballot. Who names your kid Sam Ballot? I don't know. Anyhow, <laughs> Sam Ballot and his guys failed miserably at every attempt to keep the people from working. The only thing they had left to do there's only one thing they could possibly do. Let's kill Nehemiah. Let's get rid of him. If we get rid of the leader, the people are going to scatter. If we get rid of him and discredit him, we could gain the necessary place and we can probably conquer the city. Let's get rid of him. Anyone who is in ministry must face the pressures that come with the position that you are in ministry. There's an outside battle to face in ministry and more deadly is the internal battle that takes place from within the walls. People you love, people you fellowship with, people you break bread with, all of a sudden things happen. And out of nowhere, problems happen. Why? Because our enemy is a master at deception. He is a master 
at deception, and he speaks nothing but lies. Satan either comes two ways. He either comes as a lion who wants to devour you, or he comes as a serpent. You can find that in 2 Corinthians 11.3 or 1 Peter 5.8. One commentator said this, I like this, quote, If Satan can cripple the Christian leader, he can cripple the whole ministry and discredit the cause of Christ. And this was what Satan wants to do. He wants to keep us down. He doesn't want us proclaiming the gospel. He doesn't want us raising our hand during worship. He doesn't want us proclaiming the name of Jesus Christ out there where it counts. He doesn't want us to do that because he knows the results and he knows what happens when people get together and declare God's word. He knows hearts change and he knows he loses. He doesn't want that to happen. What's needed? Constant prayer. Constant prayer is the key to successfully derailing Satan when he comes around. The word of God. How did Jesus defeat Satan in the wilderness? It is written. Many times when Satan came at him, Jesus came and said, it is written. Mark taught about it on Sunday. When you put on the full armor of God, then you stand against the wiry ways of the enemy. The full armor of God on through prayer. And you can withstand his barrage of lies. His constant lies that he throws at you all the time. Nehemiah's enemies wanted to instill fear. Not only in his heart, but the heart of the people as well. Our enemy knows that fear destroys your faith and can paralyze your life. Fear can paralyze you to keep you from doing anything. We must be ever steadfast and immovable in our faith. You know the scripture. Always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that our work in the Lord is not in vain in the Lord. 1 Corinthians 15, 50. So as we come to chapter 6, once again, he changes tactics again. He's forever changing his tactics. But you know, the old serpent, the old dragon, he don't got too many bags of tricks. He only has certain tricks. Why do you think he keeps using them? Because they work. Because <laughs> they work. Absolutely. He keeps using them because we see the fall for them all the time. He works. He uses them time and time again. And as we look, the enemy, the first thing he uses in this chapter is compromise. He uses the, 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 the tactic of compromise. In other words, we want to work with you. Yeah, yeah, we'll help you. We, we want to help you destroy, th uh, build things. Oh, did we say the story? No, no, we want to help you build things. That's what they do. Look at verses 1 through 4. Now it happened when Sambalat, Tobiah, Geshem the Arab, Arab, I wonder why they always call him Geshem the Arab, and the rest of our enemies heard that I had rebuilt the wall and that there were no breaks left in it, though at the time I had not hung the doors and the gates, that Sambalat and Geshem sent to me saying, Come, let us meet together among the villages in the plain of Ono. But they thought to do me harm. So I sent messages to them saying, I'm doing a great work, so I cannot come down. Why should the work cease while I leave it and go down to you? But they sent me this message four times, and I answered them in the same manner. Up to this point, Sam Ballot and all his gang, they opposed everything that the Jews did. They opposed everything they did from the get-go. Remember, they started opposing Ezra when Ezra came back. They opposed it and opposed it and opposed it. And now all of a sudden, out of nowhere, they come and say, oh, we want to help. We want to help. This is is an extremely dangerous ploy by the enemy. This is a dangerous ploy. And he continues to use this tactic. You know what tactic it is? Come on, you've heard it before. If you can't beat them, join them. Absolutely. Can't beat them, join them. Become one of them. Speak Christianese. Get to know them. Come in there and talk all the things. Praise the Lord, brother. Praise the Lord. Get to know the people. But silently you're going, hey, you know, I have this thing you need to know. I have this thing you need to know. And you're cutting out people and you're praying on the weak. It's a dangerous ploy. And then they want to take over. Sounds real nice. Come on out. Let's do lunch. Let's get a cappuccino together. Come on. Come on out. Or maybe you like espresso. Come on out. We'll have a good time together. Come on. Let's be. Come on. Be neighborly. Come on, fella. Anytime the enemy gets a foothold in a ministry, he begins to work from within and weakens things. 
he starts to weaken the structure of the ministry. And he does it through compromise. Little by little compromises that we make. Oh, he's a good brother. He, he means well. We'll let him do this or we'll let him do that. And there's little cracks in the dam. Remember, I'll say it one more time. Satan is the master deceiver. He will lie right to your face and make it seem like the truth. He'll lie right to your face and make it seem like the truth. He will twist God's word and make you begin to compromise the truth. He adds just enough truth to throw you off. In every lie, there's a little bit of truth. And he loves to take a little bit of truth and expand it with a huge lie. He adds just enough lie to get you on. What he wants you to do is start to question God's word. Huh, that sounds familiar, right? Genesis, has God really said you'll die? God didn't say you'll die. God knows that if you eat of that tree, you'll be like him. You'll know the difference between good and evil. And Eve started to think, yeah, well, I want to be like God. I want to do that, yeah. So he makes that. One commentator said this, quote, when you invite the devil to join your team, expect him to change the rules and the goals and expect to be defeated. How do you keep the devil from joining your team? How do you know who is the devil and who's not? There's a word. It's a spiritual gift. Anybody know what it is? Discernment. Discernment. You need to be in prayer. You need to have discernment in your heart to discern what is being said. If you're in prayer and constant communication with God, as you're communicating with him and something happens, you bring it before God and God will reveal the situation to you. If you're communicating with God, if you're not communicating with God, if you don't have that one-on-one -on -one relationship with God, and you won't have that discernment. It's a gift of the Holy Spirit, and it's a wonderful thing. So Nehemiah's enemies invited him to lunch, but he was on to them, as we read in verse 2b. But they wanted to do me harm. They wanted to hurt me, he says. They wanted to do me harm. Nehemiah rejects their offers for a couple of reasons. Number one, he knew they were lying. And he wanted only to kill them. And again, this is great spiritual discernment. He had the spiritual discernment. And I'll get, say it again. Spiritual discernment is a gift of the Holy Spirit. And it comes only when we are abiding in Christ. Praying, seeking him, and listening to his voice. I know that many of you pray. And I love the fact that you pray. But after you pray, do you listen? After you put your request before God, after you sit before him, after you read a passage, do you listen to what he wants to say? Because prayer is a dialogue, not a monologue. God wants to speak to you. God wants to show you great things. He wants to use you to do incredible things. But we have to be aware of him, listening to him, abiding in him, hearing his voice. Jesus said, my sheep know my voice. So we should know the voice of Christ when he speaks to our hearts and he opens up our hearts to us. Discernment is extremely important, especially if you're in any kind of ministry, especially when you're out giving God's word. You may be tapped on the shoulder and the Lord will tell you, get away from this person. You need discernment. We all need discernment. Secondly, Nehemiah was convinced of the greatness of the work God had given him to do, and I love that. I love that in verse 3. I'm doing a great work. <laughs> I'm doing a great work that I cannot come down. Why should I come down there and leave what I'm doing here? Why should I do that? He wasn't going to be distracted from the work the Lord had called him to do. And this is another one of Satan's big ploys. He loves to pile you with so many things that you have to do that you become distracted of what he's called you to do. There are so many things when you're dealing with him. There's so many things going on. You become distracted. Come on. You can't tell me that every time you sit down to read the Bible or pray, something happens. Phone call, thank you. Phone rings, whatever. I loved my dog. I did love my Macy. She was great. But you know, every time I sat down to read the Word, she'd jump on my lap. Now, luckily, she would just lie there and let me read the Word. But still, she was, it was a distraction. Anytime you do that, oh, I'm going to pray now. I'm going to pray. And you start to pray. And, and there's distractions. All of your mind starts to wander. At least mine does. Your mind starts to wonder all the things that you have to do. So it's very, very important that you're not distracted with the work God has called you to do. We're called to believe, and you can get distracted from believing. You can get distracted from even believing. Remember the guy, 
Your son is going to be healed if you would believe. Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. Help my unbelief because it seeps in at the craziest times. If he allowed himself to be distracted and detoured from the work of God that he had called him to accomplish, the people wouldn't have any leadership. Pressure to compromise can be a distraction. The world offers us so many things, so many things that seem to be good. But we must ever be careful about compromise. We must ever be careful to look to see what's happening. Thirdly, the Jews had nothing in common with these guys. These guys were Gentiles. The Jews had absolutely nothing in common. There was no basis for cooperation. Nehemiah made this perfectly clear back in chapter 2 in verse 20. Let's look at that. In chapter 2, in verse 20, he said, So I answered them and said to them, The God of heaven himself will prosper us. Therefore, we as servants will arise and build, but you have no heritage or right or memorial in Jerusalem. They had nothing in common with these guys. Why would they do this? Why would you combine it? Light has no commonality with darkness. We shouldn't be connecting ourselves with darkness. Light has no commonality there. We have to be ever careful. It takes discernment. Being a child of God makes us different from other people. Being a child of God makes us different from other people. We must remember that. We must maintain our separated position. Not that we can't minister to them. I'm not saying that. But we need to be careful. Don't be unequally yoked. Many people use that specifically just for a marriage or a relationship. That's true. But we have to be careful of being unequally yoked with our buddies and our friends who would pull us down, who would distract from us and, and take us backwards instead of forwards. We've got to be ever careful. Don't give in. Don't give in saying, well, you know what, if, if, if I have a problem with alcohol, so if I go to the bar, I won't drink and I'll win people for Christ. No, 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 don't do that. Don't do that. I have a problem with gambling. I'm not going to go to the casino and go, hey, hear about Christ here, unless the Lord sends me. Now, if the Lord tells me to go there, that's a different story. He'll give me the power to do it. But some people think, well, I'm just going to do that. We had spoken about Nehemiah's determination. This guy was determined. I love his determination. He's such a model for me as a leader. He's such a model for me. And now he grades not only great determination, but discernment as well. He refused to be influenced by these flimly, flimly, flimsy offers of peace. He refused to be influenced by these guys. And that, that takes a lot. That really does. You've you got to be so close to the Lord. You've got to be just wrapped up in the Lord in these things. That's why we always tell you, abide in Christ. Stay close to Christ. Be in prayer. Be in fellowship. Read his word. Get involved. Help others. You've got to be really close to the Lord. When these things come to you, you can withstand them. You can be built up and you can withstand them. If their offer was wrong thing to do the first time they mention it, why would it get better over time? Some of us think that the more we ask somebody the same thing, they'll eventually give in and say, oh, okay. No. If it was wrong then, it's going to be wrong forever. So in verse 5 to 9, there's another tactic. There's another tactic. Let's read. Yet now our fate, oh, excuse me, wrong, wrong scripture, pardon me. Then Sam, Sam Ballot sent his servant to me as before the fifth time with an open letter in his hand. And it was written, it is reported among the nations to Geshem says that you and the Jews plan to rebel. Therefore, according to these rumors, you are rebuilding the wall that you may be their king. And you have proclaimed, anointed prophets to proclaim concerning you at Jerusalem, saying, There is a king in Judah. Now these matters will be purported to the king, so come therefore and let us consult together. Then I sent to him, saying, No such thing as you say are being done, but you invent them in your own heart. Huh. Huh. How many of us invent things in our own heart? How many of us invent things? We want things so bad we invent them in our heart. For they... Are, they all were trying to make us afraid, saying, their hands will be weakened in their work. It will not be done. The new tactic, the new tactic, rumors. Let's spread rumors about them. Yeah, that'll do it. We'll spread rumors about them. We'll discredit them. We'll talk to everybody. What were they accusing Nehemiah of? Does anybody know the big word? It's called sedition that he was going to overthrow the king. He was going to become king in Jerusalem. And this would be a huge mistake if he ever did that. This would be a huge mistake, and Nehemiah knew that. They hinted that they were writing letters to stuff. Now, take a page from what happened in Ezra 4. Remember what happened in Ezra 4? 
when the letters came against them, what happened in Ezra 4? Everybody remember what happened? They stopped doing what? Work. They stopped building the temple. It worked. These rumors came forth and they stopped building the temple. So Nehemiah refused to be stopped. Sedition is an extremely serious charge. In fact, you know somebody very well who was accused of sedition. His name was Jesus. In Luke 23, verses 1 through 5, he was accused of sedition. It's one of the things they had against him. These letters that were being sent were not only insulting, but they were intimidating. Sam Ballot was trying to undermine Nehemiah's reputation and authority. If the Jews believed what was written, Nehemiah's enemy would then gather together and create further divisions. Rumors. Rumors can destroy a ministry. Rumors can destroy a person. Rumors can destroy a church. Oh, did you hear what Pastor Dave said? You didn't? Well, let me tell you. He said this. He said that. He did this. He did that. They create division. I can't believe he did that. How about that? They say, you know, the old they say. I've always wanted to know who are they. You know, they say. I always wanted to know who they were. Someone I find out, tell me who that is. There's nothing worse than gossip mongering. You like that word? <laughs> gossip mongering. That's a neat word. I like that. People who hover around like vultures, waiting for tiny tidbits of slander so that they can use. They chew on this tidbit, they swallow it, and then they find one of their buddies and they regurgitate it like a vulture and tell them the story. Oh, you know what I found out? Oh, listen to this. Did you know what Pastor Dave did this time? <laughs> you all think I'm crazy. I am. I don't know. It's great. Okay. But they're looking for somebody who has unsuspecting ears. They're looking for somebody who will give them attention and go, really? Ooh, really? Someone once, said, <laughs> Someone once says, gossip is the news you have to hurry to tell somebody before you find out it's not true. <laughs> gossip. Gossip can destroy any ministry. It can destroy relationships. It can destroy churches. It can destroy people's lives. Gossip is horrible. Don't be a gossip mongerer. I said it again. I like that word. Not only did Nehemiah, these enemies accuse him falsely of sedition, but they also said he wanted to become king to the point of saying, hey, he's even got prophets ready to coronate him. There's going to be a coronation. This could be the biggest thing of all. If the king of Persia hears that they're, 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 they're anointing a king in Jerusalem, oh boy. Nehemiah would lose his head real fast. Those guys would come down in a hurry, in a hurry. What does Nehemiah do? Look at verse 9. I love verse 9. At the end of verse 9. Now, therefore, O God, strengthen my hands. Man, I told you Nehemiah was a man of prayer. I call these telegraph prayers. Little telegraph prayers. You know, Nehemiah was in a pickle. And he didn't have time to get on his knees and say this long, flowery, gorgeous King James prayer. He didn't have time, oh, thou Lord of the creation, oh, thou of the great. You know, he didn't have time to do that. Now, God accept those, and those are lovely if you have time to do those. Those are beautiful. I'm not coming against those kind of prayers. I think they're wonderful if you pray like that or can pray like that and have the time to pray like that. I think that's wonderful and glorious. But if you don't have time, all Nehemiah said, look what he said. Thou therefore, O God, strengthen my hands. A little quick prayer. I say these things every day. I say these kind of praise every day. Oh, Lord, help me here. Oh, Lord, help me there. Be glorified here. Be glorified there. Glorify me that I might glorify you, Lord. I say these quick prayers. I told you before, the one prayer that the Lord will always answer is just go, help. Lord, help me. Quick little telegraph prayers that you pray. Now, if you have a prayer meeting and you have time, it's great to get things off your heart and pray to God in earnest. But sometimes when you're on the move, you, have, you need to pray. And here, things are happening at a fast pace. And all Nehemiah says is, Lord, strengthen my hands. Help me to get done what you've called me to do. That's what he's saying. But he didn't say that. All he said was, strengthen my hands. A quick little prayer, boom, and it's done. I, love, I, 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 just, I just love it. I really do. He didn't take a long time to pray some eloquent prayer with following words. He was quick to the point, oh God, strengthen my hands. I just, I just love that about Nehemiah. 
In verses 10 through 14, the new tactic is more threats. More threats. We've tried to compromise. We've said rumors. Now we're going to make more threats. Let's look at 10 to 14. Afterward, I came to the house of Shemaniah, the son of Deliah, and the son of Methabel, who was a secret informer. Uh -huh. And he said, let us meet together in the house of God within the temple. Let us close the doors to the temple, for they are coming to kill you. Indeed, at night they will come to kill you. And I said, should such a man as I flee? And who is there such as I who would go into the temple to save his life? I will not go in. Then I perceived that God had not, had not sent him at all, but that he pronounced this prophecy against me because of Tobiah and Sambalat had hired him. For this reason he was hired that I should be afraid and act that way and sin so that they might have cause for an evil report that they might reproach me. My God, remember Tobiah and Sambalat according to these their works and the prophets, though but none, no Adiah, and the rest of the prophets who would have made me afraid. Wow. Shemaiah the prophet, not really a prophet, he's a hireling. He's been hired by Sambalat and Tobiah to come and give this false prophecy to Nehemiah. And he recognized that. Remember John 10, when Jesus spoke about the hireling? In John 10, Jesus spoke that the hireling doesn't care about the sheep. He has no care for the sheep whatsoever. And he's basically saying, don't be a hireling. Care for the sheep. Care for the ones that are intended and given to you for instruction. Care for them. Nehemiah, he, this guy wanted to believe, Nehemiah to believe that he was also in danger. He suggested that they both take refuge in the temple. His words were threatening. They're going to kill you. Nehemiah, again, in his discernment, he quickly detects it to hope and basically said, I'm not running anywhere. Should should a man like me flee? Should I run away? Nehemiah was a man of great principle, but he had even greater faith. Should I, should I go? Because he was believing and he was trusting in the Lord. That's who he was building his house upon. He was building his house upon the rock of Jesus Christ. He was trusting in the Lord God Jehovah. Nehemiah was a true shepherd of God's people. So knowing what we know about Nehemiah, what would make him reject this offer? Would anybody realize that there is a principle behind this offer that Nehemiah rejected? Does anybody know it? It's the doctrine of Balaam. There's a doctrine, there's a law that says he can't do it. There's a law he said he cannot do it. He cannot go beyond the offering of burnt temple, and the burnt offerings of the temple. He can't go beyond that. Look at Numbers 18 and 7. Remember when we studied, it was probably 2 Kings or Second Chronicles, I can't remember where it fell. The story of Uzziah, the king. Uzziah went into the most holy place. He went where he wasn't supposed to go, and he was struck down with leprosy. And he lived out his days as a leper. Remember that? Nehemiah knew this. Nehemiah knew what he could do and what he couldn't do. As a lay person, he couldn't go into the temple like that. He wasn't allowed. He knew that this Shehemiah was a false prophet because he delivered a message that was contrary to God's word. Hold up there. Somebody comes to you and delivers a message to you. The first thing you should do is take it right back to God's word to see if what they're saying to you is true and can be confirmed here. If it's contrary to God's word, Scripture says you should pick up stones and throw it at them. But don't do that. <laughs> don't do that. We're not into stoning anymore. Don't believe them. They're a false prophet. If they come and tell you to do something that is contrary to God's word, they are as false as false can be. So use your discernment. That's why we tell you anything you hear from this podium, from me, from anybody else who stands at this podium and teaches God's word, it is your job to take it back to the scriptures to make sure what is being taught is biblical, what is being taught is truth. That's your job. It's called being a Berean. The people from Berea were no, more noble than the people from Thessalonica because they took everything that Paul taught them and, and took it back to the scriptures to prove what was true. See, there's a responsibility here. We have a responsibility in this church. 
and I'm going to tell you what that responsibility is. I'm glad you asked. We have a responsibility in this church. My responsibility, Mark's responsibility, Bill's responsibility, or anybody else who comes to this podium to teach God's word, we are to study to show ourselves approved. That's what our responsibility is. We are to study God's word, and we are to speak the word in truth in love. We're supposed to do that as best we can. Will we make mistakes? We might. And, and that's possible because we're but human, all right? But we're hoping the Holy Spirit will speak to us, okay? That's our responsibility. Your responsibility is to receive God's word, take it back to scriptures, and make sure that you're being taught the truth. Make sure that God is speaking to you through these scriptures, and you know the truth, to be set free from the truth that we teach. That's the responsibility. It goes both ways. You're supposed to do that. You're supposed to have the faith to say, okay, don't take everything at face value because if you do, you're going to get duped. You're going to get duped, and we don't want anybody to be duped. We don't want anybody to go down the wrong path. That is never going to be our intent. I know it's not mine, Mark, Bill's, anybody. It's not our intent to lead you down the wrong path. Our intent is to lead you into the arms of Jesus Christ. That's our intent. To lead you into the arms of Jesus Christ. And that's what we hope to do. So there is a responsibility in both ways. So if somebody comes to you and says, the Lord gave me this for you, and it's contrary to God's word, run. Get away from that person. Get away from that person. Because they're a false prophet. They're a false prophet. Nehemiah had great faith. He was a man of God's word. He had great faith. And he had great courage. God had strengthened him and given him such courage. Because he knew that God was always with him. Let's look at 15 through 19. So the wall was finished on the 25th day of Elul in 52 days. Wow. And it happened when our enemies heard of it and all the nations around us saw these things, that they were very disheartened in their own eyes, for they perceived that this work was done by our God. Also in those days, the nobles of Judah sent many letters to Tobiah, and the letters to Tobiah came to them. For many in Judah were pledged to him, Tobiah that is, because he was the son-in-law of Shechaniah, the son of Era, the son of Jehoiahan, had married the daughter of Mishalem, and the son of that guy. Also, they reported his good deeds before me and reported my words to him. Tobiah sent letters to frighten me. He's being ganged up on by his own people. Oh, come on. This guy's a good guy. He doesn't want to hurt you. Look at all the letters he sent you. Look at the box of bonbons he sent you. Come on, this guy's a good guy. You don't have to worry about him. Nehemiah's own people are being duped. They're being drawn in, and this is what happens. This is what happens. God can use anybody to make a miracle, but you know what? Satan is a great imitator, and he may imitate something just to get you drawn away because he's the father of all lies. He is the father of all lies. He's always looking, always looking. Enemy, he never gives up. He's not a quitter. He's always looking for an opportunity to take you down. Remember the scripture says he's looking to and fro for someone he can devour like a lion? But this tells me that even after the battle is over, even after the victory, we must be watchful. We must be watchful. Even when we don't see Satan working, it means he's probably working underground. He's probably doing something to deceive. He never, ever gives up. Open oppression to the work of the Lord is a good thing. When we see it openly, it's a good thing because it keeps us alert and it keeps us watchful. We must heed the Lord's words that he said in the garden to Peter, James, and John before he went back to pray by himself. Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. Watch and pray. It's our job to watch and pray, to be ever watchful. It's very sad when there are people who you love, people who you fellowship with, who come against the work of the Lord that God is doing through you. And it will break your heart. It will break your heart. Sadly, people only believe what they hear from someone. When someone tells them a rumor, they automatically believe it because they want nothing but to think the worst about somebody. They want nothing but to think the worst about somebody's character. 
and they automatically believe it. It's sad. It's extremely sad. They never seek the truth. Beware of the person who comes with flattering words. Beware of that person who seemed to be on your side and something but tells you you've got to be careful when some things happen like that. It's always heartbreaking when Christians go against Christians. I believe when Christian goes against Christian, I believe that Jesus cries. He weeps when he sees that, when he sees his church. But Nehemiah was steadfast and immovable. He abounded in the work with the Lord, and he was successful. He knew where his strength came from. Some of the Jews were friendly with the enemy. They always told Nehemiah how great Sambalat was and all those things. But those are those who carry their stories back and forth. They're, they're the double-edged um, secret agents. Double agents. They're a friend to you and they're a friend to the enemy. They can't wait to tell the enemy what's going on. Nehemiah caught their stuff. He looked at all their things and he was able to overcome them by faith, by prayer. By believing that God was moving in him and through him. God calls you to a good work. What does the scripture say? He who began it will complete it, won't he? He who began the work in you will complete it, won't he? So God has called you to a work. And he's going to make sure that work gets completed. And he's going to use you. And he wants to use you. He wants to use you mightily. And he wants to do mighty things through you. He wants to do mighty things through you individually. He wants to do mighty things through you collectively here at Calvary Chapel, Cape May. He wants you to see that. He wants people to know that. We hear of people who drive by, on, and then we'll hear them, and we'll see them. Oh boy, that parking lot sure is crowded. Whoa, what's going on over there? God's word is being taught. God's word is being taught, and he is doing the rest. Don't, I always pray, let no man take credit for what God is doing here. Let no man take credit for what God is doing here. And that's kind of like what Nehemiah wanted to do. I'm going to stop there. Um, we could get into chapter 7. Chapter 7 is a trillion names. And, uh, well, okay, maybe it's not a trillion. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, maybe it's not a trillion, okay? A couple hundred thousand, okay? Come on, give me a break. Son. Anyhow, in chapter 7, in chapter 7, the genealogy goes all the way back to Ezra, starting with Zerubbabel, and coming through with Zerubbabel. In fact, it's almost exactly identical to the genealogy that is in Ezra. It's almost identical. Now, when we go through this next week, we're probably going to read the first several verses of chapter 7, and then we we'll probably won't read the names unless there's something that jumps out at us. But then we're going to get to my favorite chapter, chapter 8. Chapter 8 is my most famous, favorite chapter in the book of Nehemiah. So we'll get to that next week. Read through those names. There'll be a quiz on how to pronounce each one of them. So hopefully you can do a better job than I because I butcher everything, so it doesn't really matter. So I end up saying in those guys, so you know what's happening. So anyhow, anyhow, does anybody have any questions or comments about today's study? Today's study, what we've, done, what we've just looked at, today's study. Anybody have any questions or comments? Yeah. Yeah, he, I, I agree with you. I agree. I couldn't agree with you more. I love this guy. I mean, when you read this, it's such a faith builder. When you see him standing before all his enemies, constantly being barraged with, with, with ridicule. You know, nah, 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 you can't do this. You know, name calling, ridicule, trying to discourage him, trying to make him fearful, rumors and threats and, and compromise and, and let's kill him and all those crazy things that happened. This guy stood fast. And I think, I personally think, it's because he had such a great relationship with God. He had such a great relationship with the Lord that he could cry out, Lord, help me. He, he knew that those one little prayers, those telegraph prayers would work. He knew that God would hear him and answer him. I believe that. And I believe that can happen to any one of us if we stay close to the Lord, if we fellowship with him, if we pray to him, if we come and listen to his word and read his word on our own and study on our own and, and let him talk to you from our own study. 
I mean, this is great that you're here, and I love the fact that you're here, and I'm blessed by every single one of you, and you, you encourage me to, to keep on going. But you need to be in the Word of God yourself. You need to be reading through the Word of God, and you don't have to be in Nehemiah. You can be someplace else, but let God speak to you. This is God's Word. Oh, how blessed we are to have it like this. It's been kept down for thousands upon thousands of years, and it's been kept in this position to where we can have it. We can read his breath breathe on these pages that jump out and touch our hearts. And we can learn all about him. We can learn all about Jesus Christ. We can learn about following him and, and what we need to do. And then you get into the, the epistles of Paul's and how to walk in love, how to walk in wisdom, how to walk circumspectly, how to do this and how to do that, and all these great, wonderful things. It all comes down to one thing, abiding in Christ. Staying close to Jesus Christ as best you can. And don't worry about the compromise. And don't worry about those things. And, and staying out of places that cause you to be, have trouble. Too many times we stick our noses where they don't belong. And we end up getting in trouble. We end up falling and failing. And, and God says, no, stay with me. I'm going to lead you. and I'm going to guide you. My Holy Spirit is with you. And he will lead you into all truth. Rely on me. Trust in me. Hope in me. I'm there with you. I will never leave nor forsake you. And that's what he says to us, that each one of you, if you've accepted Jesus Christ's sacrifice on the cross, if you believe that, that, that he died for your sin, and you believe that God raised him from the dead on the third day, if you believe that with all your heart, it says you're saved. And if you're saved, you're a child of God. Amen. You're his own special people. Some of us are peculiar, but he's our own special people. And he wants nothing but to love you. He wants nothing but to share that love with each of you. And each of you have an individual relationship with the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the creator of the universe. You can go to him 24-7 at any time, day or night, and he hears you. He will handle anything that is going on in your life today. Anything. From the worst of worst to the less of less. Anything at all and everything in between. He is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we could ever ask, think, or imagine. In Christ Jesus. Wow. I mean, folks, we serve such a wonderful God. And he's, all he's he called us to do is what, Irene? Believe. It's so all he called us to do is believe and trust in him. That's what he calls. So, folks, just stay close to him and continue on. And you may not be called to be in ministry at a high up, at a leader level. But you're called to walk the Christian life. You're called to speak to others about Jesus Christ. And when you do that, discouragement, fear, rumors, ridicules, all those things are going to come your way. Isn't that exciting? <laughs> Thanks for all the promises, Pastor Dave. How wonderful. But don't be discouraged. Don't let that keep you down because greater is he in you than he is in the world. And he has already overcome the world. And in him we're overcomers. So let's do what we've been called to do. Amen. Anything else before we close? Please. Amen. Yeah. Absolutely, Milton hit it you 100%. That's right, absolutely. He knew what he was called to do. He knew that Artaxerxes was given permission by God to give him that letter. And he knew that he had given that permission to him and passed it down. Because these kings had great authority. They had tremendous authority. At one word, your head was gone. These kings had huge authority. And at that time, Persia was a very, very big nation. And so they had all this authority. So when Artaxerxes gave him that approval, it, he knew it came from God because it even says that in the early chapters of Nehemiah. He knew that God had used Artaxerxes to have this happen. So he's, not only does he have a worldly king on his side, but he's got the creator, the king of kings and lord of lords on his side, which is even greater than anything we can imagine. Amen? That was a good pickup, uh, Milt. Thank you. Anything else? God bless you guys. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your word tonight. 
We thank you, Lord, that we can read it and we can glean from it and we can get excited about it, Lord. And we can get charged up, Lord, knowing that, that you're a faithful God. And, Lord, you're the same yesterday, today, and forever. We know that your word tells us that you're looking to and fro throughout the land for a heart, one heart, that you can show yourself strong on that heart's behalf because that heart is towards you. Oh, Father, please thank you for this time. Bless these saints as now as we go forward, Father God. Bless these saints as we leave this building and go into the vicious mission field outside those doors, Father God. Be with them. Guide them. Give them discernment, Father God. Help them to, to have the full armor of God on their body as they go out so that they can def def just get rid of the wiry ways of the evil one, Father God. And help us all, Lord, to stand. Stand in Jesus Christ. Be strong in the Lord and the power of his might, Father. We thank you so much, Lord, for these words that we can be read from Nehemiah, Father God. What a delight he is to read, Lord. So now, Lord, be blessed as we leave here. Protect us as on the road, Father God. Let, let traffic be minimal, Father God, and everybody get to their destination without problems, Father, until we can meet again on Sunday morning or, or whenever we meet, Father God. We thank you, Lord, for these things, Lord. And we just love you, Father God, for the way you teach us and guide us through your word. Bless us, O oh Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Love you guys. Good night.